Is this thing on? It is. So uh, good morning, afternoon, whatever it might be right now, everybody. And uh, thank you for being here. This is not at all what I expected when I was told that I would be coming down speaking under a tree. I imagined a bunch of uh, punk rockers sitting under a tree, not punk rock, you know, like-minded people by the hundreds sitting comfortably under this awesome tree. And this is an incredible atmosphere. And I'm just in awe of what Shane's completed here and what he's doing and what we're all putting together. But, you know, when I was thinking about maps, I was thinking about my perception of maps because I don't usually speak about maps. I'm out usually speaking about Haiti, and Shane sort of threw me a curveball. You know, the theme is maps. Okay, well, I have nothing to say about maps at all, I thought. And then I started thinking, what do maps mean to me, and what's my relationship to maps? And I realized that I put a lot of faith in maps. I have an iPhone, many of us do. When I need to go somewhere, I put in a destination, and the iPhone tells me where the destination is and how to get there. And I put a lot of faith in that map. And I've done that all the time, even pre-iPhone, back in the early days of humanity when we used to use paper maps. I would look at a map, see a destination, and assume that destination is where it is, and I'm going to go to it. I put a lot of faith in maps. But the thing is, is that using a map instantly implies that the destination is real and that it exists. And that's an illusion that I carry with me, and it's oftentimes almost led me astray. Case in point. I used to do a lot of support work for the Western Shoshone Nation in central Nevada. In a land rights struggle they have going on with the United States government and some huge uh, multinational mining corporations. So I used to go down to Nevada all the time. If I told you today to meet me at the Western Shoshone base camp in Crescent Valley, Nevada, I would tell you take 80 east across Nevada, take exit 261, head south through Biowawi. Once you're through Biowawi, get to Crescent Valley, Take a left, head out into the desert, go around the corner, go straight more out in the desert, about 10 miles, you're going to get to a base camp. And that's where some elderly Shoshone sisters live who are basically battling the United States government for their lives and their birthright in terms of their land. Okay. Sounds like a map. Look it up on your iPhone. Try to get to Crescent Valley Base Camp. I did it about 10 minutes ago. And what it tells you is that you take that exit, you go down to Crescent Valley, and then there's nothing. There's no left to take to head towards the mountains. And in fact, out in the desert, there's not only no base camp, but there's no Shoshone people. And the ghost of C Steve Jobs would tell us that they actually don't exist at all. There's nothing there. There's no destination. The map says nothing is there. Ask a Shoshone person what the map looks like. And they'll tell you, well, you get to this town, Crescent Valley, that was developed as a scam to scam people from California to move out to the desert and spend their money in the desert, right, on this you know, lavish town, which is actually just like this crappy trailer town, right? And what happens is, you then go out into the desert, past where the Yamba grows. Yamba's about a thumb-sized little tuber that the Shoshone lived on since time immemorial. After you go past where the Yamba grows, you go around the corner where the hot water is, the hot water that kept us alive during times when we needed spiritual healing and even just bathing. Go around that corner, and then out in the distance, there's pinyon trees, and the pinyon nuts kept us alive when nothing else would grow. And then you get closer to those mountains, near where this base camp is, and you'll find the graves of our ancestors, which carry, carry on our spiritual tradition. It's a different map. It looks totally different. But if I put faith strictly in the map that I believe in, I'd be taking lefts at things called Exit 261 and driving through towns named by people who had no association whatsoever to that community, right? So I put a lot of faith in maps inadvertently, and maybe I shouldn't. So I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I've done in Haiti. And if at the end of this talk, the message you take away is the work that I've done in Haiti, then I have failed as a speaker. It's not about the work I've done in Haiti. It's about rethinking our maps. It's about rethinking goals. It's about thinking about what we're doing and why from new perspectives all the time and listening to people. The great irony is one microphone, 100 pairs of ears, and I'm speaking. Disregard that irony, or at least take it into your consideration as you listen to me. So after the earthquake in Haiti a couple years ago, I was sitting in Seattle, literally, like when I say after the earthquake, I mean within minutes. I was sitting in Seattle with a guy who works with me as, as an assistant, you know, sort of partner, as, as it were, and uh, we were watching Haiti happen on the news. I'd been in Haiti about six months before that filming a documentary. I had some very close friends in Haiti. I saw what was going on in the news, and I thought, holy crap, this is out of control. We've got to do something. We have to do something. There's the goal. There's the destination, Haiti. We have to do something now for these people. We were all thinking some, so along the same lines. So. I started making some phone calls, and to make a long story short, I ended up on a private relief boat about a week and a half later, sailing out of Miami. And there was about 10 of us, all punk rockers. And can you hear okay in the back? Should I maybe do this? Is this better? I mean, you know, 
it's a little too loud. Well, I can I can meter that with this manual uh, manual volume control. But um, why don't I just do that? You know, we're kind of we're kind of fighting uh, the police inadvertently, as it were. So um, they know so about us. yeah, they they know about us, right? It's like it's like you know, gosh, you know, it's it's like such a crime, right, to help people in Haiti. It's you know, peace is bad for business. So anyway, so um, the point is, is that uh, I was on a, a private relief boat to Haiti. Okay, there's about ten of us. We sailed out of Miami, all volunteers on a boat the size of uh, from here to the fence in the back. And we were the first private relief boat to hit the, hit the southern coast of Haiti. We brought about 10, 12,000 pounds of medical supplies and food and sailed for eight days and eight nights. Only a couple of them, meaning a couple of us, having had sailing experience. And the rest of us, I don't know how many of you have sailed. I don't know how many of you have been on a boat having no sailing experience. I don't know how many of you have been on a boat with no sailing experience in waves that were sometimes 15 or 20 feet high at night. It sucks. But the point is, is that we got there, and we actually got there first, because we, we were in action right away, down to uh, Jock Mel, the southern coast of Haiti. OK. That story and the details of it, save it for another time. Point is, this small boat, the Liberty Schooner, arrives in Jock Mel on the southern coast of Haiti. And as we pull up to the dock in Haiti, there's people waiting for us, because they've heard you know, that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get there. And this guy is standing there, like as far away as you are, and uh, what's your name? Devin, as far away as Devin is, right? And as the boat literally comes up the dock, this guy who's standing there, a Haitian guy, says to me and my friends, welcome to Haiti. We see you as if God has arrived. Okay, life-changing moment, right? Big stuff, okay? You know, I mean, I'm a human, right? I'm like us, you know? I'm not God, right? But to this guy, 10,000 pounds of food and water, medical supplies, 12,000 pounds, God had arrived. This is major, right? And I start thinking, holy crap, what can be done? So. The boat sails back to the United States because I had friends in Haiti. I needed to see what was going on with them. I stayed on the ground in Haiti for a few days and sought out my friends, made sure they were alive, made sure they were okay, saw what was going on, met a doctor that I know in Port-au-Prince, and uh, I said to him, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. And you need to keep in mind, this is, I'm literally like, there's this moment in Indiana Jones where Indiana Jones uh, says, uh, you know, you go back to wherever, I'm going to follow that truck with the ark in it. And, uh, you know, Marion says to him, you know, you know, how are you going to do that? He's like, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go along. Okay, that, that like, as a young Greg, that line changed my life because I'm not appearing before you today as this experienced humanitarian who sails to Haiti on his yacht like Richard Branson kind of, you know. Like, I literally am making this up as I, uh, up as I go along. In Port-au-Prince, check in with the doctor. And I said to him, I'm going to go back to the States. I'm going to help you. I'm going to send you some money regularly. Roadmap destination in the distance. That guy needs money, right? He needs money and help. And I decided, because he was giving away medical supplies and medicine for free to people who needed it in Port-au-Prince, that I should support him. Great idea. Came back to the United States. I was actually sitting here in Los Angeles in my friend's kitchen, at his kitchen table, and decided, a little louder? OK, I know. Thank you. Uh, so uh, decided that what I was going to do was form something called 100 for Haiti. And what I was going to do is just seek out 100 donors to donate $1,000 each, put together 100 grand and send it down to Port-au-Prince to this doctor and his medical clinic. And you have to keep in mind, medical clinic in Haiti looks very different than medical clinic here in Los Angeles. We're talking like cinder block construction, cracks in the walls, sometimes electricity, never any plumbing, that sort of thing. So uh, great idea, perfect concept. Easy to get 100 individuals, corporations, or sponsors to donate 1000 bucks each. And all the while, I'm thinking to myself, there's something missing there. Like the map was before me, right? I know that delivering food and supplies to Haiti is a good idea. I know that this guy needs help. The map is before me. And somehow in the back of my mind, I was thinking something's got to be different. OK. At the same time, the people who are on the Liberty Schooner got back. They said, we should do another mission. Again, destination in mind. Haitians need supplies. They put together a, a bigger boat, more supplies. I got involved, put together like 30,000 pounds of rice, another 20,000 pounds of medical supplies. It was ridiculous. We had trucks shipping stuff from all over the south to Miami, loaded it on a much bigger boat, sailed that boat to Haiti. This trip, rather than taking six days, took about two months because the boat broke down and there was weather problems and blah, 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 blah. But all that stuff got to Haiti. When it got to Haiti, and again, long story short, the fight with Haitian customs to get this aid into Haiti was so insane, it would take two hours of your time to explain how it happened and how we got about getting the stuff into Haiti. But the point is, after all the stuff got in, and I came back to the States again, I'm thinking, something's wrong 
with the map. Something's wrong with the way that I'm following the map. I keep putting together like missions and supplies and it's starting to be about the numbers. Oh, we did 10,000 pounds of supplies the first time. 30,000 pounds is better. Next time we do 50,000 pounds and already the captain of the boat is saying, we need a bigger boat. Okay, so what happens next? 100,000 pounds? Do we start bringing trucks down to Haiti? Do we bring them a Subway sandwich shop and just put it right in the center of Port-au-Prince and say you're saved? What happens next? Bigger, bigger, bigger? Wrong map. A month later, I was in Haiti, and uh, I was walking through um, uh, the tent cities, and I started to really listen to people. Rather than think from the perspective of, I'm from America, I'm here to help, which is like the worst thing you could say to somebody basically anywhere in the world at this point. <laughs> I started listening to people, and over subsequent trips to Haiti, I listened more and more. And about a year ago, and I should, you know, sidebar, yes, 100, as, Sh as Shane said, 100 for Haiti formed, you know, along the way and started to, you know, just me and my ragtag group of about five of us, you know, started to form this organization. Started to really listen to people. And about a year ago, um, we were in Port-au-Prince. We were about to walk through a tent city. And we really wanted to see inside these tents because people have been living since the earthquake, still today as we speak, as we sit here right now, in tents like this that were given to them, um, you know, Second, second week of January 2010, and they're still living in them. And they have begun to literally deteriorate, deteriorate from the sun. And it's not just, you know, stalwart young people. I mean, the elderly and children are living in, in the most un unspeakable conditions all over Port-au-Prince. So walking through, walking through one of these tent cities, a guy comes up. He says, hey, hey, man, I can give you a tour. You know, let me give you a tour, right? And all over Haiti, everybody's got an angle. I mean, you know, the tour is going to, you know, lead to whatever. And you start to become numb to it. You have to kind of shut it off just a little bit because you don't have the resources and money to help every single person with an angle. But there was something about this guy, and I'm just listening to him. And he says, uh, let me give you this tour. It's like, okay, let's do this. So we start walking through the tent city. And he's not just like, here's a tent, there's a tent, there's a tent. He is like step inside this tent. I want you to see and take home to the people back home what we've been living in, right? And we walk, we're inside these tents and he's showing us where, you know, this guy almost died, he's barely alive. And yep, verifiable, that guy is almost about to die. And then here's some kids like literally sitting in piles of human waste and they're, you know, super bummed and just like on and on and on and on and on, right? Point is, we're walking through this tent city and a little girl comes up and she's begging. And she's begging in, um, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, not, not in English, but she's begging just out of, you know, in, in total desperation, right? And um, she, uh, she puts out her hand, and she starts asking, asking questions of me. And I, I speak some French, right? So I'm kind of gathering that she wants money and she's hungry. Okay? She's about six, maybe five. And this guy takes me aside, and he's like, she's going to take your money. I'm like, that I know. He's like, but what she's going to do with it is she's going to spend as little as she can on food, and the rest she's going to use to rent a bike from this guy who has this broken bike on the other side of the tent city. She's going to ride her bike around this tent city three times. That's what she gets for her, whatever it was, five good. It's like, I don't know, a matter of cents, right? I'm just like, really? I walk back over to her, and I, and I asked her some questions about some of the other details he had told me. And I asked her, I asked her in French, because he was speaking in English. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to hit her up now in French, because this was in English. And I asked her in French, I said, where do you live? And she pointed and, co and corroborated his story. And I said, what are you doing? She says, I'm asking for money. I said, what are you going to do with the money? And she says, I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat. And I said, what are you really going to do with the money? And she didn't know what to say. And I said, what are you really going to do with the money? And she said, I'm going to ride a bike. I'm like, huh. Okay, so now we're, now, now we're on a different map. Now the map's totally different. Now it's not just about food anymore. What do you do when there's a country of people who, yes, are hungry and, yes, need help, but at their core, what they really want to do is just be a little girl and ride a bike? Re restructuring, like a deck of cards restructuring in my brain, right? So I turn to this guy, and I'm like, this is for real. And he's like, yeah, this is for real. He's like, don't you see? I don't want money, he says. I want a way to make money. I want a way to survive. I want to be able to chart my own course, basically, is what he was saying. So now, all of a sudden, I'm rethinking the map entirely. I get back to Seattle. And I started walking around. We call it the office. I don't know if any of you have been to Seattle, but there's a, uh, a burrito place called El Chupacabra. There's a lake called Green Lake. Do you know it? Do you know Chupacabra? Yeah, it rules. OK, yeah, there you go. So, so um, 100 for Haiti's office is Green Lake. We go for the three-mile walk around Green Lake, and then we go to Chupacabra. That's the office. We sit and we eat burritos and just, OK. So we went to the office, and we had a talk. And the talk was, what are we doing? 
like send a bigger boat? Is that, is that what's needed? And feed directly into Haitian bureaucracy the idea that here comes more supplies, here comes more food, here comes blah, 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 blah. Or do we listen to the people and what they're saying about the roadmap that they have written for themselves, which is that at their core, at their humanity, they need the basics. They want to ride a bike. They want to be self-sustaining and self-driving. They don't want 10,000 pounds of food and supplies dropped in their lap. See you later. And I go home and I tell everybody, I rule. I sent this money to Haiti. I sent this. Bullshit. It's totally fiction. It's a fiction that I wrote in my head, like a roadmap that I wrote while blind. Okay? So what are we doing? So we came up with an idea. And the idea was for this self-sustaining project. And we called it Modal Logistics. And the way Modal Logistics works is what 100 for Haiti decided to do. And I will say, we've continued to send money to that doctor in Port-au-Prince to his clinic. And it, he's incredibly thankful. And the clinic is thriving. And you know, there's video on the 100 for Haiti site of medicine and people who's you know, been helped and whatnot. And you know, Haiti definitely needs food supplies and money. That's, that's for sure. But our focus shifted. Modal Logistics works like this. We've targeted and identified clinics and orphanages around Haiti with whom we want to work. And we are loaning them money. We're loaning them money so that they can buy motorcycles and ATVs. Almost 80%, it's said, of the Haitian population gets around by using motorcycles. Moto taxis, they're called. So if you want to get from here to Orange County, you get on, well, that's a long way for, you know, on the back of a motorcycle, whatever. You hop on the back of a dirt bike and you negotiate something with the driver, the driver drives you, you pay that driver, the driver's got a job, and life goes on, and you've gotten your ride. What we decided to do is we decided to give, um, you know, through a no-interest loan, money to targeted orphanages. Take, for example, Kai Angel. It's an orphanage in Jacmel, Haiti. They serve children who have or who have been affected by HIV and AIDS. There's a woman there from Amsterdam who has lived in Haiti for 15 years. All she does day in, day out, is try to figure out how to get resources together to pay for the diapers, soap, and lives of these kids who either have HIV or AIDS. Okay? And uh, take Kai and Jell, for example. We're going to loan them money, and they're going to buy a motorcycle with it. And what they do with that motorcycle is they use it by day to transport patients and supplies. They use it by night as a moto taxi service. They find somebody in, in the community who needs a job. That's just about everybody. And they negotiate on terms with the driver for what the driver needs for his or her services. And I will say most of the time it's his services because women, by and large, don't drive moto taxis in Haiti. But so if I say his, I'm not being sexist, that's just the deal. So what he needs for his services. And once they reach a point where the hours that he's trading of his life for money are worth what he's being paid, they work out a deal. So basically, no interest loan goes to Kai and Jell Clinic, Kai and Jell Orphanage. And they use this motorcycle by day. And then at night by taxi service, that driver drives that motorcycle, raises money all night long, driving this taxi around. And what he does is he takes a percentage. That's his salary. He's got a job. Kai and Jell takes a percentage for repairs. Kai and Jell takes a percentage for themselves to be able to sustain the clinic. And a very, very small percentage, 5 sometimes 10%, goes back to repay the loan to 100 for Haiti. And we sign an agreement with them that they will pay back the loan over between four and six years and what happens is we've rewritten the map. No longer is, I stand here, you need help, I raise money, I give you money, you spend money. We've just taken a very valuable human resource, which is people's time and their passion and their devotion, and essentially we've squandered it. Because once that money is spent, it's gone forever. And what we've done is we've rewritten the map. Now what we've got going on is a situation where we get to reuse that money. Money's worthless. It's a fetish object. What we can do with it is astounding. So when we give money to that, that orphanage and they buy that motorcycle, somebody's got a job. In time, Kai and Jell pays off that motorcycle and they own it outright. And what 100 for Haiti has is the principal back on, an, on, on a no interest loan basis. And we're willing to lose whatever percentage we'd make profit on the loan or interest on the loan. That's for crazy people. We just want to have people have jobs and be able to define their own future in Haiti. So if somebody wants a job in Haiti, now they can get one, right? And if, they, if Kai and Jell needs the resource of a motorcycle full time, it's theirs. And no outlay of cash for them. So in time, we get to reuse the money that's coming in through donations. OK. The reason this is cool is not only because it's a great idea, but also because it's working. Yesterday, when I landed here in Los Angeles, I went straight to the bank and I sent down a, uh, basically all the money in the 100 for Haiti account to a partner in, in, in Haiti 
Um, we are providing motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles for the first ever all Haitian EMT training program that's being done in Haiti. It's being done, uh, the Brazilian government in, in conjunction with the Canadian government in conjunction with a group of, uh, called Global Dirt. They've been on the ground since the earthquake. We're providing, uh, with the same deal, motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles for the first all Haitian EMT program in Haiti. And it's the same deal. The chunk of money that we sent down in time comes back to us. We get to use it elsewhere to other clinics, you know, and they get these motorcycles. They get Haitians, like, get to be empowered. They get to be their own care providers. They get to be their own roadmap writers, if you will, you know, because everybody in the world flew down to Haiti to help them. And I, you know, people were listening, and there's amazing groups on the ground in Haiti. But the question becomes, you know, are we listening well enough? Are we really serving the people? You know, is the roadmap we're following one that we've written? You know, take a right at exit 261 through Biowawi into the desert, or is it one written by the people? You know, that talks more about the burial sites of ancestors, the Shoshone, like we talked about before. So that's, um, I have notes here that I wanted to follow. But uh, is that making sense so far? Okay, cool. All right, good, good, good. I'm glad. Um, so, uh, and I don't know, oh, you know what? I'm, how am I doing time? Like, I'm out. Good, that's perfect, because I've got one more thing to say. Okay, so um, you're all smart people, obviously. That's like a given, and that's not just me, like, you know, just like, you know, saying a nice thing so you smile at me, you know? Um, you're obviously smart people. So um, Shakespearean people amongst you? Anybody know Shakespeare? Okay, um, three. So you're not so smart after all. Anyway, um, but, uh, okay, so in Hamlet, right? Um, Hamlet, there's a scene in Hamlet for those. Uh, in fact, maybe I should take a step, a step back. Shakespeare was this playwright. He's dead now. Okay, um, there's a scene in Hamlet, right, where there's a play going on, and instructions are given to the actors in the play. And the instructions given to the actors in the play are suit the action to the word and the word to the action. A little bit earlier, um, the instruction is, uh, you know, nor saw the air too much with your hand thus. I'll translate that into English for you, right? Suit the action to the word and the word to the action. When you're an actor and the line is, you know, um, you know to be or not to be, that is the question, right? Everybody in the world, first time out acting, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question, right? It's this dramatic thing. How many am uh, of, amongst us have ever thought about killing themselves? You don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. I'll raise mine. You know, in those moments where you've thought to yourself, I'm an idiot. My life is over. I'm going to kill myself. And you're asking yourself to be, meaning to live, or not to be, to die. That's the question. You don't lay there in your bed at night, right, with a 45 next to your head going, to be or not to be. You know, you're like literally, you're like laying there just like in your head. If you even vocalize, it's astounding, right? So suit the action to the word, the word to the action. Don't make the words you say and the actions that go along with those words be incongruous. Make them line up, you know? Nor saw the air too much with your hand thus. To be or not to be, that is the question. You know, don't make these dramatic gestures with your hand when what you're really talking about maybe is, is a close matter of the heart, okay? That's the point of all this. If you read a map from the perspective that's in your mind, you're gonna end up possibly, not always, but possibly not suiting the proper action to the proper word. The proper goal might have a path on it that's not the best one. When you start to listen to people, you start to rewrite a map. And instead of sawing the air with your hand thus and making dramatic statements of, look what we can do in Haiti, I started off by telling you, if you leave here by saying, oh yeah, he did this cool stuff in Haiti, you've missed the point. It's not about the size of the boat, right? You know, it's how you sail it. So the point is, is that, you know, and why you sail it more importantly, okay? So the thing is, is that if you saw the air and make these dramatic statements with your hand, you're going to miss the point that while you're doing this and making a show of yourself, you're not listening. And again, the great irony is that there's one microphone, one voice for the last 30 minutes. You have been very generous with one of the most valuable resources you have in your life, which is your time. And with all that said, if we get a chance, and I hope we do over the course of the day, I'd love to hear what you have to say as well. Thanks, everybody.